All right, take your Bibles and join me in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, please. It's the last time I'm going to say that for a while, okay? This should be the last sermon from 2 Corinthians this morning. And if you're interested in reading ahead for week after next, Sunday after next, we're going to go to actually two books of the Old Testament. We're going to look at Jonah and Nahum. Now, just so you know up front, the point of those books is not the fish. Just so we know, okay? Now, we have what is not our theme. But this morning we finish up 2 Corinthians. So, if you've found chapter 13, follow me as I read verses 7 through 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 7 through 14. Paul wrote, Now I pray to God that you do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that you should do what is honorable, though we may seem disqualified. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. And this also we pray, that you may be made complete. Therefore, I write these things, being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness, according to the authority which the Lord has given me for edification, not for destruction. Finally, brethren, farewell. Become complete. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let's pray. Well, Father, we we want praise and honor to go to you and to Christ. That, That is why we're here. We have learned that is why, not just why you saved us. It's why you created. It's why you've done everything. It's why you will do everything for honor and glory that is due you and your son. So, Father, as we get into your word this morning, this this last piece of this particular letter, that's what I want. That's what I pray for. That's what I request. We we want to be on the same page with you. We we want to want what you want. I think we do. We struggle. There are times we don't, but right now, we want what you want. We want you and your son, to get the worship, the, the gratitude, the, the renown, the adoration, the devotion that you deserve. But then also, we want it to be more than just right now, where this is a worship service and we feel like this time is designed for that. And so we, we tend to pray more and we tend to sing and we tend, we tend to say things that are, that are giving praise to you. But, but we want this to take place in our lives as well. As we go out of this place and this particular time and we live um, in the world, in our jobs, in our neighborhoods, as we interact with other people, we want them to see this coming from us and hear this coming from us. And as they watch us, we want them to see it's not fake, it's not phony, it's not forced, it's real, it's genuine, because this is what your Holy Spirit is producing within us. That's what we want, because that's really how glory comes to you in a life, not just a segment of time, but a life lived that way. So, Father, I pray that through the things we see this morning, things we read, hear about, think about, the conclusions we reach, we want them to, to, to culminate. We want them to roll out in this kind, of, this kind of fruit in our lives, all so that you will receive the glory that you deserve. And I pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. Well, this is it. This is the culmination of really not just this letter, but all three letters that Paul has written to these believers in Corinth. This is the summary of all of his interaction with these people and all of his observations of these people. And I would say his instructions to this point in time to this congregation of believers in Corinth. Yes, Paul is hoping to see them soon. He's told them that in this letter several times. That's his desire. That's, that's his plan. But if it doesn't happen, if, if things turn out where Paul never sees these people again, this is what he's been trying to say 
all along. This is what he wants from them, and this is what he wants for them, all at the same time. And if Paul does get there, as he's planning to, I think he'll just keep building on these particular desires there in person, okay? So what would you think Paul should say at this point in his letter? Seems like we've been watching and listening to Paul for a long time now. As I've been studying it, put more time into it probably than most of you, but as I've been studying this, I've kind of felt like we were there with Paul in Ephesus when he wrote 1 Corinthians. And I, and I kind of felt like when Paul left Ephesus and he went to Troas and he was planning to go on over to Corinth from there and he was waiting for Titus to show up, I kind of felt like we were there waiting with him and anticipating that visit. And then it felt kind of like we've been sitting with Paul in Macedonia as he's writing this and making his plans and sending Titus and the other two guys down to Corinth ahead of him, it's kind of like we've been there with him in Macedonia. At some times during this study, I have felt like Timothy and Titus, like, like I'm watching Paul grieve over what's going on in Corinth, grieve over their sins. It's kind of felt like I'm just sitting on the sidelines with Timothy and Titus watching this. At other times, I don't know about you, but at other times, I've kind of felt like the Corinthians, like Paul's exposing me, exposing my sins, exposing our sins as a congregation. It's, it's gone a couple of different directions, but my point is we almost feel like we're a part of this story by now. So after all of that time and after all of that talk, what would you think Paul would want them to hear and remember and believe and do until he gets there in person. Well, I'm going to let Paul say it. We have our opinions. We would probably each close the letter in a different way. But what, what, what does Paul leave with these people? Well, I'm going to give you three things up on the screen this morning that I find in these last seven or eight verses, three main things that Paul is leaving with them. And he, and he starts with his heart for them. Paul, one more time, he's done it before, over and over again, actually, but one more time, Paul wants them to hear his heart for them. Now, Paul's agenda has been in question there in Corinth, right? We've talked about this. Those false apostles who were there in Corinth have been accusing Paul and his crew of workers of having ulterior motives. They're, they're really self-serving I know what they told you. I know what they, they taught while they were here. I know what they've said in their letters, but they're really up to something else. They're just after an ego boost. It's, it's all about their pride. It's all for their glory, their own fame. They're, they're just trying to get control of you people, probably trying to get more of your money from you. That's been the accusation that Paul has been fighting against throughout this entire letter. And evidently, there are some Corinthians that must be buying that. They, they must be con at least considering it and, and possibly believing it. It's kind of why Paul's had to write this, this letter. So Paul bears his soul to them one more time here at the end of this letter. And I want you to look back at verse 7, if you will. And here's one of the first phrases where this comes out to me. Verse 7, he says, Now I pray to God that you do no evil, not that we should appear approved. So, so I'm not doing this so that we will appear approved. What Paul is doing for them, what he's telling them to do, what he's wanting for them and what he's wanting from them is not for his own reputation or Timothy's own reputation or Titus's own reputation. That's not what it's about. They're not just using the Corinthians to make themselves look good. And our boys grew up playing Little League Baseball, and if any of you have ever been involved in Little League Baseball before, you, you'll understand what I'm saying here. Paul is not like the father who struts around among all the parents after his kid hits the home run in Little League. Like, did you see that? I did that, really. I'm responsible for that. He came from me. That's not what Paul's doing with the Corinthians. It's not like Paul is saying, look at the holiness of these people. That's because of us. We caused that. See, we really are apostles. That is not 
what Paul or Timothy or Titus are up to. No, he says it very clearly right here. They don't care how they look. They don't. Even if they look like complete failures, even if it looks like they had nothing to do with the maturity of these Christians, that's what he means when he says in verse 7 also, though we may seem disqualified, down at the end. As long as God's people end up as they should, Paul doesn't care if he's ever credited for any of it. He's fine if they say, Paul who? He is fine if they end up even thinking Paul was a complete fake. Doesn't matter to him as long as God's people end up spiritually mature like he wants them to. Paul doesn't care. But even if Paul's enemies are right in what they're saying about him, even if Paul and Timothy and Titus did have some ulterior motive in their ministry, the Corinthians need to understand what Paul is saying in verse 8 also. Look down there, if you will. Verse 8, he said, For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. Now, what truth is he talking about here? Can I get it up there? Yeah. What truth is Paul talking about? We can't do anything against the truth, but for the truth. Well, this is the Apostle Paul writing here right? So he's probably talking about the truth that Christ has given to his apostles to teach to the church, the truth about Christ and how to live by faith in Jesus Christ. If you sum up all of the letters from all of the apostles to all the churches, that's really what they were talking about. Here is the person and work of Jesus Christ, and here's how you live by faith in him. Paul says that truth, we can't do anything to resist that truth. We are only for that truth. So even if Paul and Timothy and Titus were up to something for themselves, they don't have any power to oppose that truth, to stand against that truth, to to stop it from getting to God's people and sanctifying God's people. The fact is, Paul says, they are bondservants of Jesus Christ. That's who they are. That's what they are. And Christ will use them in spite of any impure motives they may have, and Christ may even use any impure motives that they have to serve his truth. Now, Paul has proven this in another one of his letters. You remember there at the beginning of his letter to the the church at Philippi, where he says, okay, there are men out there, since I'm in prison right now for preaching the gospel, there there are men who have gone out and started to preach the gospel because I'm in prison. And they basically say to the people they're preaching to, look, we're preaching the same gospel that Paul preached. Paul's in prison for doing it. We're preaching the same gospel and nothing's happening to us. Therefore, Paul must be disapproved for what he was doing or how he was doing it. And we are approved for what we're doing and how we're doing it. We're greater. That's the rumor that had come back to Paul. What was Paul's response to that? I don't care. Whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is glorified, and that's all I I care about. And so Paul was noticing other people who were doing what they were being accused of, but the point comes down to this. The truth is going to be delivered to God's people, whether by pure motives or insincere motives. Paul says, I, Timothy, Titus, we're just servants of Christ. And not that our motives are impure, but even if they were, he's still going to use us to serve the truth for your sanctification, for your edification. And that should have been very comforting to these people. But it tells us something about Paul as well. He knows who he is. He knows who he serves. And Timothy and Titus do as well. And Paul even went as far as to rejoice when Christ's agenda required hard things of him. Look at verse 9 two with me, if you will. He says, for we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. That's no surprise to us reading this statement, right? Because we read verses chapters 11 and 12. And Paul went in great depth in those two chapters of of laying out different examples of how weak they were and what had made them weak. You know, the the fastings and the shipwreck and the the stonings and the the, the, the beatings that they took and all the weariness and fatigue from, from, from everything that was involved in their ministry. I mean, Paul just laid it out in great detail. And he made it clear that those weren't just accidental, unfortunate byproducts of his travels of traveling so far and traveling so often 
through bad weather in foreign lands without good enough preparation and without enough support for what he was trying to do. No, it's not what was happening. Paul made it very clear when he was talking about his thorn in the flesh that Paul's weaknesses were sovereignly caused and allowed by God so that Paul and God's people could see the power and the glory where it really is. Not in pitiful, sinful men, but in Christ, in Christ alone. Paul understood this, so he was glad for his weakness. We hate weakness. We hate anything that, that, that makes us sick or makes us tired or, or makes us sad. We, we try to avoid it, and when it comes, we try to get out of it, and we bemoan it, and we pray that God will take it away right now. Paul was not like that because Paul understood what he was there for. He understood the result of his weakness. So he was glad for those weaknesses when they helped God's people to focus all of their attention on Christ and enjoy Christ and worship Christ and serve Christ and not get caught up in the men that were delivering the message. If weakness gets me out of the way and shows Christ to be up on the pedestal, then I am glad for my weaknesses. That's what Paul meant when he said, um, for we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. Strong in what way? Strong spiritually. Strong in a sense that you are all about Christ. You see his glory and you want to live for his glory because of it. That's what it looks like to be strong. Paul says, if my weakness takes you to that point, I am glad for my weaknesses. Wow. It's an amazing attitude, isn't it? Paul was all about the best for these people. And that best that I'm talking about here carried something else with it as well. Look down at verse 10. Paul says, therefore, I write these things being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the authority which the Lord has given me for edification and not for destruction. When I say Paul was after the best for these people, I also meant Paul was all about protecting them too. And that's what he's saying in verse 10. Paul is trying everything he can do to avoid discipline when he gets there. He's going back. He's planning to. It's on his schedule. He's making the arrangements. He's already sent the men ahead of him to, to get things started and prepared for him when he gets there. Paul is planning to go there. He wants to be there, but he does not want to bring them pain when he's there in person. He doesn't want them to feel like he's there to destroy them, just to bring destruction into their midst. Paul does not want that at all. He wants them, when he gets there, to all be happy together. The Corinthians, him, to be happy together, to enjoy each other. He wants to be able to celebrate with them what God is doing through all of them and among all of them. Paul wants to be able to fellowship together with them and worship together and serve together. Paul wants to go there to encourage them, not to make them sad. So what he's saying is, this is why I'm writing this way. I'm writing with sharpness. And he does. Here and other places, Paul just gets right to the point in his letters. Paul names their sins. He doesn't say, well, you guys just need to be looking for sin. No, he says, this sin is among you. That sin is among you. You're practicing that sin. He calls out specific sins. He expresses his grief over it. He demands repentance of them. And he even threatens discipline at times. And he does that hoping that writing with this sharpness he won't then have to speak with that sharpness when he gets there. When he gets there, they will have already read the letters and taken it to heart and repented over the things that he brought out so that when he arrives, they are ready to, to rejoice with him and celebrate with him and grow with him. And that's what he wants in person. So he's protecting them from the destruction by writing this way now. It's all about protection. And folks, this is his true agenda. You see it in these statements. This is his true agenda. And it's far different from what they're hearing from those false apostles. Or what they're getting in the background from those guys is different from what Paul is saying here and what he's been saying through the whole, through the whole letter. This is his heart. Paul is for Christ. He is for the truth. And he is for them, not for himself. I can't get away from that statement that he made, I think, back in chapter 12, where he said, um, I will gladly spend and be spent for your souls. 
That was the agenda. That was the heart of the Apostle Paul. And it comes out all through this closing. Oh, that every evangelist and every pastor had that kind of a heart for the people to whom they were sent. So he shares his heart with them. Here's the second thing I see in this closing section, and that is he shares his expectations of them. Not just his heart for them, but he had certain expectations of them. Now, let me move down through these fairly quickly. What I'm trying to show you is that what Paul wants for them requires some actions of them. And, and Paul's no exception to the rule here. Every one of the apostles writes this way. They want certain things for God's people, but it requires actions from God's people. Paul doesn't want them reading this letter and sitting still. That, that's, not, that's not the process, okay? If they're going to become what he wants of them, and if they're going to enjoy what he wants from them, they've got to commit themselves to doing certain things. So, Look at verse 11 with me, because most of them are in verse 11, starting with the first sentence. Finally, brethren, farewell. Now, if you look at the screen, there's a different word on the screen, right? It's the word rejoiced. Some of you have the word rejoice in, in your translations. You probably do, don't you? Well, what's going on here? Well, if you have farewell, like I just read in the New King James, it's not wrong. Don't, don't freak out or don't think I got confused and Type the wrong word up on the screen. There's an explanation for the differences in the translations. This Greek word that is translated as farewell in some translations, rejoice in other translations, is one that was used as a greeting or a farewell. It's commonly. I mean, this was, this was a word that was used both of those ways. It meant when you met someone, I am rejoicing to see you. Or if you've been with someone and now you're parting ways, you might say, I rejoice that we spent time together. Or I hope you're rejoicing that we got to spend time together. So it, it is, a, is a form of farewell that includes the subject of rejoicing, okay? So that kind of a farewell makes sense in this spot in this letter. But there's only one problem with it. When you look at this in the language, Paul uses this word farewell, rejoice, whichever it is. Paul uses it as an imperative verb. You know what that means? This is a command. Paul is telling them to do something, not just making a statement, not just making an observation about himself. He is telling them to do something. And that's why some of your translations chose this word, rejoice, as a command. He's telling them to rejoice. And I like that. I actually prefer that translation to these people in this spot, okay? So remember, you're always looking at things in context. Who are they? Why is Paul saying what he's saying to them? Why would he need to say this to them? Well, when you think about this subject of rejoicing, this is something that all believers should, should do, right? I mean, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, rejoice evermore. So rejoice today, rejoice tomorrow, keep rejoicing for all of eternity. And, and he told the Thessalonians that, here he's telling the Corinthians to rejoice. This is a command for all of God's people, right? This should be the natural result of redemption. If you're here this morning and you've been redeemed from your sins, if God is saving you from the wages and the power of your sins, if, if you have justification, if you are being sancti sanctified, all those words that we use part and parcel of God's work of salvation, if you're receiving that, if you're experiencing that, then you should be rejoicing all the time. I should too. It's, it's a common byproduct of, of understanding this, something that we should be doing, too. Not just that it, it will be happening, but we should be doing it. It's a responsibility. God deserves this for what he's done for us, right? Okay. But these Corinthians are kind of special. They're, they're in a special spot at this point in time in the, in the circumstances in which they find themselves, circumstances which they created. I think maybe right now they need to be reminded to rejoice maybe more than usual. You think about it. They've had so much turmoil in their midst, so much frustration, so much division among the people in this congregation. Paul has addressed so much sin in their midst. 
This is the third letter now, and we don't have one of them, but 1 Corinthians, it was just chapter after chapter after chapter on sin in their midst and the way they're abusing the privileges that God had given them, the way they're abusing one another. And Paul's threatening that when he gets there, he's going to discipline some of them very strongly. And back in 1 Corinthians, he did demand that they discipline one of the guys very, very strongly. They're being confused now by the lies of these false apostles who are there while Paul is away. So you look at these people right now, and, and they might be discouraged. They, they might be worried. This group of people might be fearful right now. They might be wondering by this point in time if Paul sees anything good about them. They might be wondering if Christ is doing anything good among them at this point. They might be wondering if their best days are past, if there's any hope for this congregation. So these people need the reminder to do that which is commanded of all of God's people to do. And that reminder, rejoice, should cause them to think about all the reasons they have to rejoice. Paul gives them a few in, in this closing section, and we're going to talk about a couple of them with a little bit more detail in a second. But Paul is telling them there is so much that should be giving you joy on the inside. So think about that stuff. And then let that joy out. Express your joy. Rejoice all the time, even in the midst of your hard circumstances. This is what Paul expects of them. This is what Paul is demanding of them in closing. I'm, I'm, I'm summing up all of my letters. One thing I want, want you to do is rejoice, okay? There's something else. Look at the second statement in the very same verse, verse 11. Finally, brethren, farewell, then become complete. Become complete. Now, let me say two words. Some of you are going to start laughing and others are going to think, what is he talking about? Darning socks. How many of you have darned socks in here before? And I'm not saying those darned socks. No. How many of you have darned socks? Phil lifted his hand up, so Phil has done it. it used to be a long time ago when you got a hole in a sock, you didn't throw it in the trash can like we do today, Right? You got a needle and thread, and you sew the edges of the hole back together so that it's all pulled together and there's no more hole in the sock. Keep wearing the sock. That is what Paul is commanding the Corinthians here to do. Not fix the holes in their socks, but fix something. Become complete. Allow yourselves to be repaired. Allow yourselves to be restored. Allow yourselves to be fixed spiritually. Paul has exposed a lot of holes, spiritual holes in this congregation. There's a lot of individuals that make up this congregation that have, got, have stuff going on, should never have started. It's continuing. They're unrepentant over it. And Paul has pointed it out. There's a hole, there's a hole, there's a hole, there's a hole. And now he is telling them, allow yourselves to be fixed. Allow the holes to be repaired. And Paul knows how that happens, right? I mean, he wrote to the Galatians, if you look over a couple of pages to the right, to Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, he's talking about this with the church in Galatia as well. Brethren, if any man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. It's a different word, restore. That word means to set a broken arm or to sew up a, a fishing net that has a hole in it. So the same idea. You who are spiritual, be on the lookout for those who have holes, and then use the Word of God to try to fix them. Wednesday night, we're in the, at the end of 2 Timothy chapter 3. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. We talked about that Wednesday night, and in the context there, Paul is talking about the man of God, Timothy, and other men who handle the Word of God. Some of their chief responsibilities are to take the Word of God— use it to call out sin in the lives of brethren, and then to correct that sin. That's the process of Christians becoming complete. That's what it looks like. That's, that's one of the ways God carries that out, fixing, retrofitting, retrofitting, um, re repairing his people spiritually. And Paul is looking at a group of people here who have a lot of holes in them spiritually, and he's saying, submit yourself to the process of being fixed. Okay? 
It'll happen through men of God using the word of God. It'll happen through other believers who have spiritual gifts to use them in your life to help you to deal with the sin, to come to repentance and be fit out again the way you should have been originally, okay? Keep letting that happen. Keep submitting to the process. There's another thing. Right after that, in verse 11, Paul goes on to say, um, farewell, become complete, be of good comfort. Now, the word for comfort here is the same word Jesus used to describe the Holy Spirit when he comes. The comforter is going to come. I'm going to send him when I leave. Some translations call him the helper. Same word. That's the word that's being used here. The Holy Spirit is someone who comes alongside God's people and kind of acts like an attorney, right? When, when you've got a legal matter and you don't know what you're talking about, you don't know what you ought to do next, you don't know how to protect yourself, you go to an attorney, he sits down next to you, and he takes the law and he gives you counsel. He advises you. He, 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 he gives you a roadmap out ahead of you. He tells you what you should do and tells you what you shouldn't do so that you are protected, so that you, you take the right steps so you come out of it as, as well as you possibly can. That's some of the work of the Holy Spirit. He comes along as a guide, as, a, as an instructor, as an exhorter, as, 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 as someone who's going to, to correct you when you're wrong and, and give you the right way it should have happened, okay? But this is also talking about how the, the Holy Spirit comes along like a concerned friend at times. When, when you're way down and you're, you're depressed and you're discouraged and you're sad and he comes alongside with his arm around your back and encourages you lifts you up and, and builds you up and, and helps you your thoughts to be correct and your feelings to be correct. He exhorts when we're lazy and, and pushes us forward gently, okay? Well, Paul has tried to be that comforter for them through, through his letters that he's written, through the men that he's sent into their presence. Paul has tried to give them that kind of comfort, and so now he is begging them to receive what he's intended for them to have. Okay, the other two letters I wrote to you, when you get this one, I want you to listen to them. I want you to read them because within them is great comfort for you. Within them is instruction. Within them is exhortation. Within them is, is counsel. Within them is, is correction. Within them is, is, is everything that you need to be made as you ought to be, to be fixed like we were talking about in the last statement. Once again, submit to this. Allow this to take place in your life. Allow yourself to be comforted, okay? Now, he goes on to something else in verse 11. I know we're moving quickly, but he says, be of good comfort, and then he says, be of one mind and live in peace. I'm going to put them both up here at the same time because I don't think you can tear them apart. They're separate, but they can't be separated. One must produce the other one. One is dependent on the other one, okay? Well, the first one, be of one mind. It literally means to think the same thing. Think the same thing. All you Christians in uh, Corinth, everyone who makes up that congregation in Corinth, I want you to think the same thing. Now, that doesn't mean all of God's people have to reason the same way. Kevin and I are your pastors, and we think very differently. I mean, if you look at what logic looks like to Kevin and what logic looks like to me in any given situation, he's going to be coming through this side. I'm going to be coming through this side. We probably are all different in that way. And that's one of the beauties of creation and, and, and the, the magnificence of God that he can, that he can create. What do we have? Eight million different people on this planet right now. And every one of those people reasons in a different way. Okay, granted, that's the way it's supposed to be, Right. But what Paul is saying is even though we reason differently and we have different logic sometimes, we want to be on the same page spiritually. We want to have the same attitude about everything. We want to be after the same thing. We want to reach the same conclusion. We might, we might get there a different way, but we want to reach the same conclusions spiritually. And isn't it obvious why Paul would push this on these, these people? You go all the way back to the beginning of 1 Corinthians, and you remember the very first sin that he addressed with this congregation? Contentions. Contentions. They didn't have the same mind. Oh, they would say, oh, I'm, I'm a follower of Peter. I'm a follower of Paul. I'm a follower of Apollos because he's better and he's better and he's better. And because I follow him, I'm better than you are. And they looked down their noses at one another. They were not one-minded, okay? 
And so it's very appropriate that Paul pulls this out at the end of this third letter. He's still thinking about this. He knows this is still an issue in this congregation, and not, not just in this congregation. I mean, to the Romans, he wrote the same thing. You don't need to, to, write, to turn here, but Romans chapter 12, verse 16, he said, be of the same mind toward one another. To the Philippians, he did the same thing. I mentioned them a little bit ago, but listen to this language to the Philippians. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one, of one accord, of one mind. Paul is giving this instruction to pretty much every congregation that he writes to. Why? Because in every congregation, you've got incredible diversity. You know, we don't have that many people here this morning, but in the number of people here this morning, there's a tremendous amount of diversity in this congregation in the way our minds work, what we think about and how we think about it. And that's, that's wonderful. That is great. But with that comes great potential for division also because we are sinners. And even the good stuff that God has given us and built into us, we will corrupt in some way. And so where we're diverse and where we're different from each other, there's the, there's the possibility of pride and arrogance and conceit and criticism and judgmentalism. And that's what Paul knew was present in every congregation he was writing to. So he is telling them all the same thing. Be of one mind. Every believer is supposed to be on the same page with the rest of God's people. And what does that look like? Well, I'll give you one little two-word statement that would probably sum it up. Sola Scriptura. That's what would pull us all together. Scripture is our sole rule for faith and practice. If every one of God's people put that up in front of them, Sola Scriptura, everything I believe, everything I do is going to come from here. We would still disagree on some things, but we wouldn't disagree on nearly so much because we're both going to the same place for our instruction and our conclusions. And on all those matters, those other matters that aren't addressed in the word of God, what do we do? We give. We give up. We give in. We put our liberties to the side so that we do what's coming next on the list. And that is in verse 11. I already put it up there. Live in peace. Live in peace. You know, insist on harmony. Don't allow friction. Don't allow turmoil. Don't allow fighting. Refuse to be against one another. That's what it looks like to live in peace deliberately, on purpose. This is not just a byproduct of being one-minded. This is something that is intentional. And it comes from every one of God's people saying, I refuse to be against another one of God's children. So we change if we have to. We change if Scripture tells us to. We give up our liberties if it's, it's going to offend another Christian in some way. That's, this is what we do. In my favorite book, Paul brought this out so vividly to the Ephesians. He said, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through you all and in you all. And because of all that oneness that is in God himself and from God himself, that's what we have to strive for as God's people. Making sure we keep peace, refusing to be against each other, always striving to be for each other and with each other. So we live in peace. Well, here's the last expectation that Paul has of them, and it might seem strange to pull this out and deal with it. He says in verse 12, greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, I would think there's nothing special about this command because it's kind of like our handshakes here. When we see each other, at least before COVID, when we saw each other, stick out our hand, right? And we would shake hands. That, that, is, that was our normal greeting, happened all the time. We would do it. If, if we knew the other person, we would do it if we met a stranger for the very first time. It, it, it was the greeting. And it's what they did the same way, but it wasn't a handshake. It was a kiss, kiss on the cheek, okay? But Paul doesn't just say, kiss each other. He says what? Greet each other with a holy kiss. And by adding the word holy here, that changes things. That makes this something that is not normal. 
This, this is abnormal. This, this now is a kiss that is set apart from what is common. This is special in that other person and your relationship with that person. A holy kiss is given, given to someone who you know is special to God. Someone who you know is a child of God. This is a brother of Jesus Christ, and this is one of my very own brothers in Jesus Christ. So you are recognizing that the two of you have a relationship that is rooted in grace. This is a relationship that has been purchased by the blood of Christ and delivered to each of you by the Holy Spirit himself. This is you recognizing that the two of you enjoy special benefits and are headed from the same special inheritance in and through Jesus Christ. So when you see each other, when you're in each other's presence, greet each other with that kind of knowledge. I'm not saying you have to kiss them in a special way. This is not, oh, this is a kiss on the mouth, not a kiss on the cheek. It's not about the, the MO. It's about the mindset. It's about the attitude. It's about the recognition. It's about the knowledge. It's about the feeling for the other person. This is a holy kiss. This is a holy greeting because that's a holy person. And so am I. It's all because of Jesus Christ. Special relationship, okay? Paul expects that of these believers along with all of these other things as well. Now, here's the last thing I want to point out to you, and and we find this so vividly in the last section as well, and that is Paul has a particular hope for them. Or, I'll say it this way, Paul shares with them where his hope rests for them, okay? All that Paul wants from, from these people and for these people ultimately rests with God, okay? And you see it in several different places. Back up to verse 7 again, where we started. And I know we've kind of broken this thing apart a little bit, but needed to do that. But verse 7, Paul started verse 7 by saying this, Now, I pray to God that you do no evil. I pray to God that you do no evil. All right, so think about this for a second. If, if Paul wants them to stay away from evil, why not just command them, stay away from evil? It's on you do it. You shouldn't do evil. We all know that. Stop doing evil. Don't do it anymore. Stay away from it. And he basically told the Roman church that very thing, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. That's, that sounds like what he should have said here, right? What's the difference in these two things? Well, we know from 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians that Paul has commanded these people in several different ways to stay away from evil. But Paul also knows that perfection is an impossible task for any Christian. As long as we've still got this old man, which we will have until we we die, we will still be tempted and unfortunately given to evil at times. So what Paul wants from these Corinthians, he requests it from God for them. You follow? Okay, I'm going to tell you to quit doing evil, but I know you. (laughs) So I know it's going to be out of your hands to do this perfectly, to never do evil again. So what do I do? I go to God. That's what he's telling these folks. And it shows up, look back at verse 11 again. It's something we've already talked about. It shows up in this command in verse 11 to become complete. You see that? Remember we talked about that? Allow yourself to be fixed. There's holes. Allow allow those holes to be fixed. Ultimately, though, the repairs have to be made by whom? Yeah, I mean, what does he say up there in, in verse um, verse 9? Look at it. He says, and this we also pray that you, may, that you may be made complete. Become complete, but I'm praying to God that you will be made complete. Do everything you can to get fixed. God, please fix them. Where's the hope lying? In, in, in the sinner? In the believer? No. Paul's ultimate hope for them rests in God and his work to fix the holes, to repair what's damaged among these people. But he doesn't stop there. This gets better and better and better. Look at verse 11, if you will. And Paul, Paul makes another statement in verse 11 that, that really shows where his hope lies. He says, finally, brethren, Farewell, become complete, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace. 
and the God of love and peace will be with you. She love that statement. Now, make sure you understand that is not a conditional statement. Paul is not saying, do this, do this, do this, do this. And if you do all of that, then God will be with you. That's not what he's saying here. This is not a conditional statement. This is just a statement of fact. You do this, 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 and this. And oh, by the way, God will be with you. There's a ton of comfort in that statement, isn't it? God will be with you. The God of love and peace will be with you. And folks, that's their comfort. That's their hope. That's their security as they try to do all these things that Paul expects of them. God is with us. So his love and his peace are with us. So what that means is joy and repair and comfort and unity and peace are very possible. The presence of God gives God's people every reason to expect godly results. And Paul's last verse, verse 14, makes that statement kind of like the grand finale in a fireworks show. Look at verse 14. Paul says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. What a closing. I seriously thought about just preaching that verse today, just that, nothing else, because this thing is pregnant with truth. I mean, ready to deliver, (laughs) bulging. It's just amazing how much is here when you slow down and read it and think and start going all the directions from each one of these statements that Paul makes in verse 14. I can't think of anything better to say to a group of believers and and individual saints in the closing of a letter or at any other time as, as far as that goes. Basically, folks, this is the contribution of each person of the Godhead to the work of redemption. That's how Paul chose to finish this letter. Of all that he wanted to leave with them, okay, I've gone through this and that and the other. What, what, what do I still need to say? What can I, what can I not leave out? The work of each person of the Godhead in the work of redemption. That's what they need to hear last. That's what I want to stick in their minds. That's what should influence them more than absolutely everything else. So so look at his statements, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there he's talking about the Son, God, the Son, second person of the Godhead. And what does he attribute to him? Grace, grace, the choice to favor us, the choice to gift us. And how did the Son of God do it? Through incarnation. That's the name Jesus, the man. Jesus of Nazareth. It's the grace of the Son of God that caused him, or that is him, becoming the human being, Jesus of Nazareth. And he became Jesus of Nazareth, the human being, to serve as the Christ, the anointed Savior from God, the one chosen and sent into this world to save God's people. That's who the Christ is. And also to be our Lord, our governor, the one who owns us, the one who commands us, the one who protects us as his citizens, the perfect Lord of his people, son of God, grace. Second, and the love of God. Now, anytime Paul separates God from Jesus Christ, he's referring to God as the father. So what is attributed to the father? Love, the love of the father. I love the song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. That's one of my favorite songs, probably is for some of you as well. The love of the Father is what generated the incarnation of the Son. It was the love of the Father that says, I love my people so much, I want the best for them, I will do the best for them. And so he sent his only begotten Son. And his only begotten son came and did what the father had laid out for him to do in love for his people. And by the son doing what had been given him to do, the son actually earned a different kind of love from the father for his people, a fatherly love. Because of what the the son did through grace, now we are qualified to be adopted into the family of the father and treated as his children. It's the love of the father. The grace of the Son, but he doesn't quit there because there's another person of the Godhead, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. You may have fellowship in your translation rather than 
communion, great, great translation. The presence of the Holy Spirit gives us fellowship with God and fellowship with one another. It's his presence that makes us joint partakers. All of us share together, all who have the Holy Spirit, we share together in the inheritance that is given from God to his people, sealed with the Holy Spirit in each one of us. But it also makes us joint participants in the work of God. We participate together and we participate with God in his great work of displaying his glory. Paul talked in Ephesians chapter 1 about God the Father doing everything to the praise of the glory of his grace. You exist, and the Holy Spirit exists in you, and the Holy Spirit exists in each one of us and all of us at the same time, so that all of us will share in this work of displaying the glory of God. The world can look at us, and they can see that our God is not normal. Our God is absolutely brilliant. Our God is breathtaking because he took a dead person and brought him to life. And then he took all of those formerly dead people and brought them together in one body. All this diversity and incredible unity where we love and follow his son. And through all of that, he is glorified. So it's the fellowship, the communion of the Holy Spirit, just like the love of the Father, just like the grace of the Son. This is the redeeming work of the Trinity. And Paul is telling these people, last on the list, highest on the list probably, the one thing they need to understand, the one thing they need to hold on to, the one thing they must never forget is what? That it is with you all. In fact... The translation is a little sloppy there to end. New King James says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. What's that sound like? It sounds like another prayer from Paul. It sounds like Paul is saying, Oh, I go to God all the time and I ask that these things will be with you. Is that what Paul's saying here? No. Do you notice that the word be is in italics? Why? Because Paul didn't write it. That's not in the original writing. The little word be, the the translators added that to help us understand what Paul was getting at here. And usually they do a great job. I don't think they did here. I think if they were going to add a word, they should have said the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit are with you all. Because that's the truth. Paul didn't have to pray for them to get this stuff. If they're his children, if they're they're God's children, if they are believers, they have all of the redemptive work of the Godhead going on in them and for them at all times. Folks, that is the key to all of those expectations that Paul has of them, all the commands that he's given them, that is the key. This is the foundation for the life of every child of God. When you understand this and you appreciate this, Any command that this God, this Godhead gives to you, why won't we want to do it? Why won't we? That's our motivation. That's what drives us. It's not not begrudging obedience. It's not, oh, I better obey or God's going to beat me to death. It's not, well, I guess I have to or somebody's going to look at me cross-eyed. It's not that at all. I have the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit. I have those things. They're being done for me. They've been done for me. It's going on inside of me. Why wouldn't I obey what he wants me to do? Look how he loves me. Look how he's for me. Look how all of my eternity has been purchased for me together with him. Why wouldn't I do the things that are expected of me? And This is how Paul is ending his letter to them. So he stressed his heart for them once again. He, he gave them his expectations of them, and this is his hope for them. His hope rests in the work of God, not in them, not in their, not in their success, not in their own efforts at sanctification and repentance. No, his hope rests in God and who he is and what he's doing for them. So my prayer for us is that the Holy Spirit will use all that we've seen in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, and even in this closing, that he'll use that in our lives the same way Paul wanted it to be used in the lives of this congregation. If Kevin and I can have the same heart for you folks, 
that Paul was describing here for the Corinthians. And if all of us can strive for the same things that Paul expected out of this congregation, with the same hope resting in God, glory will go to Christ and joy will come to his people, which is ultimately what we're after, right? So let's pray that way for each other. Father, we thank you again one last time for sharing this letter with us. Not only for having Paul write it for this church, yes, all important. They needed it desperately, but we need it desperately too. And I thank you and praise you for preserving this letter for our benefit so we can learn. So the holes in our lives and our congregation can be exposed too. So we can know what needs to be done about it. So we can know who ultimately needs to do it about it. So Christ will get the glory that he deserves through our lives, our choices, our desires, the way we carry out those desires, the way we live with one another, the way we live in the world with one another. We need what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. So thank you for it. Now, Father, we know our tendency. Our tendency is to move on. Our tendency is while something's going on, we're in it. We're excited about it. Five minutes later, well, what's next? Don't let that happen. Don't let us walk away from this, like looking at ourselves in the mirror and walking away and forgetting what we've seen. Help our memory, please. Through your Holy Spirit, will you please work in our minds so that we retain what we've learned? And when we go back and we read these verses again, stir up our memory. Oh, yeah, I remember when we looked at that and what Paul was saying, what that was all about and how they were struggling and what needed to be done about it. I remember that and, and, and help us to use it. Truth brings you so much more glory when, when, when it's carried out, when it's used. So, Father, help us in that endeavor. We want you and your son to receive the, the recognition the credit, the attention, the pleasure that you deserve as your people live out your word. Sola Scriptura. We thank you for it, and I pray that you would do everything to make it our sole rule for faith and practice. I pray it all in Christ's name. Amen.